Hello and welcome once again to Rewind. We're here at Doha's iconic Museum of Islamic Art to mark the 10th birthday of Al Jazeera English by taking a fresh look at some of the best documentaries of the past decade. This week we rewind to an episode of a special four-part series from 2009 looking at Pakistan's role in the so-called War on Terror. In the second part of Pakistan's war, we were given exclusive access to the Pakistani army in their full-scale military offensive against fighters on the frontier with Afghanistan. What's the situation there like today? We'll find out later from our correspondent in Islamabad. But first, let's watch Pakistan's war on the front line. Pakistan stands accused by its closest allies of not doing enough in the so-called war on terror. But its military has been waging a fierce battle against Taliban militants in the northwest tribal district of Bajor. Their commander, Fakir Mohammed, has declared a unilateral ceasefire and promised to stop attacks on the Pakistani army. I traveled through these tribal areas to witness the human cost of this conflict and the harsh reality for the Pakistani army as it threw tanks, artillery and air power into the battle. I've come to witness the battle for Bajor in its third month. More than 8,000 Pakistan troops have been fighting in the valley, trying to push Al-Qaeda and the Taliban out of the town of Loisam, just 13 kilometers away. A walk outside the fort is a walk through a ghost town. Houses are empty, the shops are shut, the street vendor stalls are abandoned. A township of 11,000 people has been displaced by the fighting. For many, this is what Pakistan's war with the militants has brought. 400 families from Bajor fled across the border into Kunar province in Afghanistan. Another 300,000 people came to the camps inside Pakistan. Officials say 95 civilians have been killed. The government, the UN and charities, this one funded by British Muslims, have provided tents, blankets and food. This is for your family. From the 12 person, our family. 12 people. 12 people. Just this and that. Yes, there. These are all refugees from Bajor. Nurzada is a teacher from the militant-controlled town of Loisam. When the war started, I was teaching. It was 12.30. When I came out, I could hear the army firing. Then the militants came and they fired face to face. I got into the car and rushed home. When the bombs started and fell on our homes, we left at about midnight and we traveled through the night over the mountains for three to four hours. Before the fighting began, was the area where you were living, Lursam, dominated by the Taliban? Before the war, the Taliban were in control. They controlled everything. They had Sharia courts that dealt with all matters completely according to Sharia law. This is just one camp. Some refugees have gone to the cities. Visiting another camp an hour away, I find local families are helping from their own private resources. Umar Khan is one of them. He's been here every day with food provided by his mother and aunt. I feel very bad for these people because uh, they have nothing to do with these old cases like, uh, you know, and yeah, terrorism yeah, and yeah, terrorism and uh, you can see these old people, they got, they got nothing. They didn't even got a single penny to buy food for themselves. And none of them know when they'll be able to go home. Back in Bajor, the operations against the Taliban and Al-Qaeda continue. General Tariq is planning a big push against the militants' main base. He arrives with Colonel Zahid, 
who will lead the troops into the battle. Before the operation begins, the general rallies his troops with a reminder of how the Taliban have hijacked Islam. Infantry ka role kya hai? Close with and destroy through skillful firepower and maneuver. Hai ki nahi hai? Close with and destroy. Thik hai na? Usko ja ka pakana gale se aur usko wahan se bahar nikalna apne mood se. Kar sakte ho ki nahi kar sakte? Bahut hi asun ka moral down hai. Nahi sir. To abhi taiyar hai aap log? Sir. Inko bara dun ki aa rahe hai 63 FF aa rahi hai. Sir. Colonel Zayed's men prepare their weapons for battle. From the security of the fort, their first objective might sound straightforward. The men have to take another mud-walled compound. It's only 800 meters beyond the village of Tanghata, which they already control. But similarly straightforward targets have cost many casualties in the past. Just before dawn and the main battle tanks have begun moving towards the front line and this suggests that this is the main military push by the Pakistani army against the militants here in Bajor. Almost midday, but I've been told I can't go to the front line just yet. There are rumors that Colonel Zayed and his men have been ambushed by the militants. Casualties start to arrive, including a captured militant. This is the daily price of Pakistan's war in its own land. Since joining the so-called War on Terror, over 1,400 Pakistani soldiers have been killed and nearly 3,400 wounded. The Bajor campaign is a powerful answer to anyone doubting Pakistan's commitment to this war. As a new battalion leaves for the front line, I'm finally allowed to go forward with them. Watching the men going into attack, I wonder what the day will bring for them and whether all of them will make it back. Suddenly, tanks come charging down the road from the front line. The troops are moving forward very slowly, as you can see, uh, down towards Tanghata, which is just a few kilometers. But you may be able to hear there is still quite a lot of heavy fighting going on. You can hear small arms fire, heavy machine guns and mortars um, from both sides. And uh, we just learned that the tanks that came back quickly up the road had come under very heavy fire. As the firing gets closer, the soldiers pull back. I think what's happened is that the tanks who came driving up the road incredibly quickly um, came, in fact, came under an ambush, and the uh, tank commander is just giving uh, the uh, field command back up the road details of what happened, but he's obviously still quite shaken, understandably. 
Suddenly, the situation has changed. It seems that the Taliban have counterattacked. The orders are to retreat to base. I think the shocking thing of today was seeing the audacity and the daring nature of the militants, how they, you know, ferociously re-attack positions they were driven from only a few days earlier. And as a result of their hit-and-run tactics that we saw for ourselves, two Pakistani soldiers are dead, seven are wounded, one of them critically. From the front line in Bajor, I return to Peshawar. I've heard that after I left, Colonel Zayed and the men I had seen go into battle came under heavy fire again. The fighting lasted three hours, and in the end, seven of his men were killed, 27 wounded. One of the wounded was Colonel Zayed himself. His right foot was so badly injured that it's been amputated. In the military hospital here in Peshawar, I found his wife, Uzma, by his bedside, along with friends. Hello, Ray. Nice seeing you. What happened? We were going for the Skampa, which were occupied by the miscreants. Yeah. And over there, I caught a mortar shell right. and two bullets in my Good right point. foot. So mm. and they tried their best to open Well, it's a big sacrifice. It's a very big sacrifice. No problem. These sure. sacrifices yeah. we have to make yeah. for yeah. the country. For the religion, more yeah, important. More important. Yeah. We are not scared of sacrifices. You see, he's joined the army to serve the country. Yeah. So that's no problem. Okay. We are not he's scared. more brave than me. <laughs> <laughs> there speaks a soldier's wife, glad at least that her husband is alive. But that grit captures the mood of Pakistan's army today. The gravity of what's happening in Bajor is being felt in Islamabad. President Zadari has called a meeting of the elected politicians from the federally administered tribal areas known as FATA to try to work out what can be done to bring stability to the region. People have this impression that this is a law and order situation, whereas it is not a law and order situation. This is a full-fledged insurgency going on in FATA. Peace and stability in Afghanistan is a must. Some bridging needs to be done. The American drone attacks have greatly inflamed the situation, and Washington is still pressuring the government to do more to destroy Al-Qaeda and Taliban sanctuaries in the tribal areas. But President Zadari knows he has to deliver development to achieve a lasting solution. We've got to get them special concessions. We've got to put in industrial bases there. We've got to put in uh, proper units to employ the youth. Today, the uh, militants pay more than we can pay our soldiers. They're that rich. So one has to make the region understand that uh, it's uh, in their own interest, in the interest of the future generations. One way the government hopes to turn the tide against the militants is by supporting local tribal leaders, the Maliks, who want to take on the Taliban. The government has taken a gamble and has armed local units of tribesmen known as Lashkas. One of the biggest has been formed by the Salazai tribe in East Bajor. On the way back to Bajor, I've stopped off in Salazai country to meet them. They claim to have 4,000 fighters once, they supported the Taliban, but turned against them when they started killing Salazai tribal leaders. We don't know why they are doing this. We don't know what they want, what their purpose is, or why they are destroying the peace here. They are killing Maliks and local people. What is the way forward for ordinary people? The Lashkars have done all they can to bring about peace and will continue to bring about peace. 
But in the end, it's the government's responsibility to bring about overall peace in this area and to provide security for the people. We will do what we can to support all the security agencies, whether it's the Bajor scouts, the Bajor police or the army, inshallah. Now, a sense of normality has returned to the Salazai area, a confidence. The shops are now open. The Lashkar here is all powerful and on guard to make sure the Taliban don't return. This could be a turning point in the fight against the Taliban, but the fear remains that tribal militias could become too powerful and turn against the government if their hopes aren't satisfied. After three weeks, I am back at the Bajor fort and things have moved on. I'm allowed to meet prisoners the army believes to be Taliban. And these are some of the POWs that have been captured recently over there. These men are still being investigated, so they can't be named. I came to the local bazaar and there were seven or eight Talibs there. And they said, you take these machine guns and go and give them to Talibs at a nearby place. I said, no, I can't do it. You do it yourself. Then a Taliban by the name of Muhammad Zada said, I know you and the village that you come from. And if you don't do it, we will not let you go and we will kill you. So I went and on the way saw soldiers. They said to put down the weapons and arrested me. And another soldier came and blindfolded me and tied my hands. All of these men deny they are with the Taliban. All have a similar story to tell. Across the fort, in the operations room, General Tariq is reviewing the plan of attack. Tanks can support him from here. He can move outflank this Nala further from the north. So I would like him to use the battalion mortars here. He Thank uses you. tanks out here. He starts moving from here. And start fire and move also from the front. There should be no problem. Right, on bye sir. We are about to start with our uh, main offensive tomorrow morning. The uh, people and the tribes have uh, decided to stand up. Uh, I think they have the confidence to do so. If you look at it from a global uh, point of view, this is a global war on terror, and uh, it does have a share in this. Uh, so I think uh, by, by getting this under control, there would be some peace, uh, at least inching forward, I would say, at the global level. on the same road to Loisam. In the past three weeks, the army has taken the road bit by bit. And I've not been beyond this point before. I catch the sound of shooting and duck for cover. Eventually, we get to the front line. It's the last compound before the town of Loisam, held by the militants. The soldiers are securing the compound. The bulldozers have moved in. Colonel Anjum is leading the operations here. This is the place which is called the Rashakai. Rashakai was the strong hub of miscreants. Of the Taliban? Of the Taliban. In fact, they were sitting here, they were causing a lot of uh, problems to us. In fact, there were a lot of tunnel system here. Right. They were well linked, OK? Right. And uh, Alhamdulillah, today we have captured this. Yeah. And we intend going with a smooth speed. So you've just captured this? Yeah, just now. This, this just now? You please go back Thank now. You, ma'am. OK. The army does not want us here because, um, in fact, we've come further than we're supposed to have been. This is 
very much an active uh, line. As the colonel was saying, they've only just taken this position today. Let, let's go, actually, there's some fire. As I left, the army was putting everything into its fight in a final push to rid Loisim of the militants. And now, more than four months of relentless fighting has brought the Taliban in Bajor to a standstill. Fakir Mohammed, their commander, has declared a ceasefire, so temporarily at least, there is peace. My journey here really changed my perceptions about this war on terror and what it means for Pakistan. We are suffering the maximum. We have killed the maximum. The army has shown that it's capable of hitting the militants hard in the tribal border areas. And it's clear this is not just a proxy war for the West, but the battle for Pakistan's own sovereignty and democratic system. In the end, fighting cannot resolve the conflict. But while the leadership of Al-Qaeda survives and has Taliban support, this destructive war looks set to continue here. Ultimately, the only real hope will be a common desire to move beyond differences, to build peace in a democratic Pakistan, and a chance for the development it so desperately needs. Pakistan's war on the front line. So has that hope been realized over the last seven years? A question we put to veteran correspondent Kamal Haider. Tens of thousands of people have been killed in Pakistan. We have been covering the conflict for many years, but there is a marked improvement after the final push by the military to dislocate various groups who were using North Waziristan as their base. It was considered to be the impenetrable inner sanctum of these various groups, but a major offensive by the military was able to dislocate them, and that denied them an operational base from where they could plan. But serious challenges still remain, despite an improvement of the security situation here in Pakistan. Those challenges, particularly from the Tariqa Taliban Pakistan fighters who were able to escape the military operations and seek sanctuary on the Afghan side of the border. And now we also have this new phenomena of ISIL or Daesh trying to reassert its control in certain areas of Afghanistan, which may pose a threat to Pakistan. But Pakistan's security forces are trying to come to grips with the situation. And although challenges remain, the security situation has seen an overall improvement. Well, that's all we've got time for this week, but do check us out at aljazeera.com. You can have a look at all the other films we've got for you in the Rewind series. And like us on Facebook as well. We're at facebook.com slash AJ Rewind. Give us a thumbs up. From us here in Doha, it's goodbye for now.